What's up, weebs? I'm Jeff Thu, professional shitbag, and this is not my mother's basement, because as I said at the end of my last video, Avatar is an anime, fuck you, fight me, I've actually moved out of my mother's basement in an effort to be more productive and less of a hiki neat, and also because I wanted to live with my girlfriend. And speaking of two of those things, I don't talk about Konosuba nearly enough on this channel. It's one of the best shows of last year, and one of my favorite animated comedies of all time. So when Bookwalker, Kadokawa's official ebook store, reached out to tell me that they're going to give the original light novels an official English release, I was pretty damn stoked. And not just because it gives me an excuse to talk about the excellent OP of the second season, although, yeah, that's a nice perk, but because I've been itching to read it for a while now. It's interesting to see how the story evolved from page to screen, and Volume 1 is just plain fun on its own. If you're interested in reading it yourself, you can use the gift code Mother's Basement on Bookwalker, that's all one word, Mother's Basement, to get 600 yen off the list price, which means that you can read it for as little as $2. You can use that code for anything else on the store, they've got Spice and Wolf, ReZero, Bakano, and Hadaraku Maosama, and a ton of of other great books, but if you pick up Konosuba before March 6th, you'll also be entered to win one of five fabulous posters autographed by the show's talented voice cast, or one of ten stylish t-shirts emblazoned with Best Worst Girl Megumi. Babe, Megumi's on the back, you were supposed to turn around when I said that. There you go, champ. Oh, and if you're not up to date on any version of Konosuba, you can watch it on Crunchyroll. And you can do so free for 30 days if you use the URL crunchyroll.com slash basement to sign up for a free trial. Konosuba's second opening is absolutely fantastic. Unlike the first one, which introduces us to the characters through little disconnected comedic vignettes, this OP tells us a complete story. It's a simple one, Kazuma and Ko go questing for a golden apple and then shenanigans ensue, but that little narrative hook makes it much more memorable, and having context makes the gags all the funnier. The OP starts with a short introductory scene of Kazuma walking into the Adventurer's Guild Hall, intercut with Aqua, Megumin, and Darkness posing, and already the effort that went into making this thing is clear. This first-person cut lasts just 24 frames, exactly one second, but it's comprised of six different layers with detailed set decoration and a dozen unique characters, two of whom are animated. The guy in front just follows a motion tween with a blur effect applied to him, but that's all they need to do. One neat little trick that's used to make the scene feel even more lively is that while the man and woman are both animated on twos, i.e. every other frame equaling 12 frames of animation each, their animations are staggered. One always moves while the other is standing still, so the image changes every frame as though it were animated on ones, making the motion through the town feel smoother without putting extra work on either character's animator. This shot of the guild interior also lasts just one second, and seems mostly static, which would be fine since there are enough interesting characters in frame to keep you occupied for a single second as the camera pans across. But even when she doesn't need to be, the receptionist is fully animated as she walks up to the board and places the poster for the quest. All of these images flash by in less than a second. Most OPs wouldn't bother animating even one of them, but there are only four shots in this entire OP without any kind of movement. This OP is basically always moving, it's constantly animated, and that's on top of the details poured into every non-moving part. Like how all of these posters that we only see for all of 12 frames have their own original artwork and text written in a fictional language that actually actually does translate into Japanese. As our heroes rush off toward adventure, we see that even the title card is fully animated, bouncing playfully on and off the screen. The same was true of the first OP, of course, but the off-kilter framing and running pack of idiots below makes it feel even more dynamic and lively. I really like the composition of how the title is framed here. It just looks nice, and the same can be said of most of the credits in this OP. While they don't do anything special with the fonts or kinetic typography, it's clear that a lot of these shots were composed to accommodate the titles in an eye-pleasing manner and draw your eye to read them. 
Kazuma tripping and knocking over everyone behind him also makes for a strong comedic cue to cut away from the main title, bringing us to this shot of the heroes running forward down the road. Another simple but important thing to note about the animation here is that their run cycles are staggered, which prevents their movements from looking robotic or synchronized. They all seem to be in good spirits for a few moments until they run out of breath after a few jump cuts. Darkness, the most physically fit among them, is fine and holds Aqua's hair back while she pukes. By the way, I love the consistency in Aqua always puking rainbows because she's a goddess. It never fails to make me laugh. And the punchline, that they're barely a mile away from town when they collapse, is equally strong and equally good at getting me to laugh. This is one of those few totally still shots that I mentioned, and I think the lack of movement helps to sell their exasperation and disappointment in their own failure. After sulking, they regroup and head out again, and we break into a delightful little intermission card that shows the four of them awkwardly dancing before giving a goofy thumbs up. Here they're showing us in a thoroughly silly manner that despite their ineptitude, they're ready to give it their all. Kazuma certainly puts his all into practicing with his short sword as his friends take a lunch break. He's so enthusiastic about it that he ends up losing the thing and conking himself on the head with it, which of course makes Aqua burst out laughing. She and Megumin both giggle at Kazuma's pain as they fix him up, while Darkness looks more worried about, or possibly jealous, of his injury. As they walk on, Aqua keeps gloating at Kazuma while everyone else has let the joke pass. This emphasizes the fact that Aqua is a big dumb jerk and a cannon trash tier waifu. But, and this is important, Kazuma gets over his irritation and smiles at her antics for a split second before a giant worm pops out of the ground and eats her. And man, is his reaction to that perfect, but let's take a step back. I think this smile hits on something vital to Konosuba's success as a series. Yes, these characters are jerks. Yes, they're idiots. Yes, they get on each other's nerves. But at the end of the day, they're all really good friends. And the misery that they put each other through is all good-natured fun. That's a big part of this show's appeal. The humor can get downright vicious and mean, but we as an audience are still inclined to like the characters because they still like each other. Anyway, the whole party gets eaten and excreted by a giant monster worm, and everyone takes this about as you'd expect. Aqua cries like this spoiled baby she is, Megumin and Kazuma just kinda deal with it, and Darkness, of course, enjoys the pain and humiliation. What follows is another dancing interlude that inverts the optimism of the last one. Now Aqua is smiling through her tears, Megumin and Kazuma are feeling harrowed, Darkness is blissed out, and actual best girl Chamusuke is once again just kind of confused. I've gotta say, I adore the goofy, exaggerated faces and actions used throughout this OP. It's super fun to look at. Although on that note, let me go off on a quick tangent. I've heard it said that Konosuba Season 2 looks cheap, that the animation is bad. The people who say this don't know what they're talking about. There's this perpetual misconception in the anime community that the most important thing when it comes to animation is making nice screenshots and staying on model. Any animator worth their salt will tell you that these things are low priorities at best. In fact, two of the 12 principles of animation, exaggeration and squash and stretch, explicitly encourage going off model for effect. In fact, it's the philosophy of John Kay, the creator of Ren and Stimpy, that trying too hard to stay on model limits creativity and makes animation actively worse. He famously decreed that his animators weren't allowed to draw the same pose twice. And by the hand of character designer and OP director Kikuta Koichi, that philosophy is alive and well in Konosubo. If you look at this scene from episode 6 where Aqua is freaking out at Kazuma, every single frame is an entirely different pose from the last. That doesn't just happen by accident. Though there are some genuine flubs in the show, most of the time it's done intentionally to make the show feel more lively and funny and goofy. And the same idea is applied to this OP. Which I should really get back to, it just bothers me to see all of these nerds be so goddamn wrong about everything all the goddamn time. But if you want to hear more about what actually good animation entails, I recommend checking out the Canepa effect like his entire channel, but also specifically his episode on the new Pokemon series. I'll link that in a card. 
we finally see what our heroes have been heading toward, a derpy looking giant turtle with a tree growing from its back. And here we can see the OP's one minor mistake, at least in my opinion. There's no clue as to why they're going there. For the sake of the viewer, I think it would probably be a little better to put a quick cut to the apple before zooming out, or maybe show it glinting in the tree branches, but it is easy enough to follow despite that after the first time you see the OP. On that note, the reactions of Kazuma and the rest of his party to this seemingly impossible task are hilarious. I'm glad that when it comes to a choice between humor and Moe, the animators choose the funny option. I do think it's a little odd, though, that Darkness is the one who figures out how to get there. She definitely would be on board with a plan of action that involves her potentially getting hurt, but I don't get the impression that she's smart enough to figure out the dynamics of launching a steel door by hitting derpy-ass rock bombs. Still, it would be weird for Kazuma to suggest it and then suddenly be miserable and horrified with the rest of his party, so I think it's okay for Darkness to be a bit uncharacteristically inventive here. And man, I love how into it she is. Like, she can't believe she really gets to do this stupid, stupid thing. It's also really cool that this moment reincorporates a problem from the original opening. I love when OPs create a sense of continuity like that. Darkness does eventually actually hit those bombs, and the looks of sheer horror on Aqua, Kazuma, and Megumin's faces as she does so are just priceless. Especially for faces that you only get to see for a split second. Even for the few frames in which the door takes off where we see it at an extreme distance, the animators paid attention to detail. As it rockets into the sky, you can see Kazuma and Aqua falling off, followed by Darkness and Megumin at the height of the launch. One big strength of the way this OP is presented is that it shows us just how each of these protagonists copes with different situations, which tells you a lot more than you'd learn just seeing one of them deal with the situation individually. For instance, most of the party is controlling their descent with some degree of calmness, whereas Aqua is just flailing through the air like a falling infant. Looking at his face, we can see that Kazuma isn't taking it super well either, but at least he's making a bit of an effort to control his descent and not die, potentially. Darkness is having a metaphorical blast, of course, whereas Megumin has a literal one. She's surprisingly calm and collected as she casts her signature explosion spell in Freefall, but then she's always been the most level-headed member of the group. In a display of actual good science, Aqua uses her Rhymant to catch the backdraft from the explosion, turning it into a hot air balloon to bring them all down gently. Even as she's blown directly above us, it's still not clear if she's wearing pantsu or not. Perhaps we'll never know the answer to that mystery. The figurines haven't made it any clearer. Right before she catches them, we see each character once more. Darkness is falling with a confident enthusiasm, whereas Kazuma is sobbing uselessly. And having just used her explosion, Megumin is, of course, paralyzed. This is great attention to detail, and there's something downright hilarious about seeing her faceplant into the balloon. Now Kazuma gets his moment to shine, using steel to grab the golden apples from the tree. Another really strong point for this OP is that every character gets to show off their personality and a signature move, but this is brought about organically through a story instead of just shoehorned in. I like that a lot. I also adore these two shots before Kazuma steals the apple, purely because they're so exceptionally well composed. As Kazuma uses steel, we cut away to the party returning to the guild as heroes, or at least as adventurers with enough gold to buy everyone a round of drinks. And I do mean everyone. Of course, the receptionist is there, but so is Yunyun hiding behind a pillar like the adorably awkward loser she is, and Wiz out in the open with a lovely jiggle to rival that of the receptionist. And of course, all of the adventurers are here, including that one guy with the mohawk who shows up everywhere to cheer Kazuma on. Calling it now, this guy is secretly the Demon King. This final thumbs up with the golden apples nicely ties together those dumb dancing interludes with the rule of threes. These guys are beaten and bruised, but they've completed their quest and made it home in one piece. Their optimism was not unfounded. The conclusion to this sequence is straightforward, but again, I want to take a second to appreciate how lively and expressive the animations are, and how much attention is paid to the little details. 
Tyndales. Like every single adventurer in this hall has their own unique design, something that stands out as memorable about them. Nobody here looks like a generic NPC, which is important beyond creating a good sense of continuity between the shots. One of the underlying themes of Konosuba is that the world Kazuma finds himself in isn't so different from our own in important ways. That means that life here can be mundane and a little bit of a struggle, but that also means that everyone around him is their own unique person. No one is just a face in the crowd. The animators don't just focus on these details to show off, they do so because it's important to making the world feel alive. And over the course of this short story, Konosuba's world absolutely does feel like a living, breathing place, even if that breathing is a bit labored from too much laughter. This is a wonderful, hilarious opening that reminds you exactly why the show that it's attached to is so wonderful as well, and it's the perfect start to the best comedy of the winter 2017 season season. Konosuba is also a good book, though. The director of the series famously decided to take it on after getting sucked in and reading the first two volumes in a single day. Remember, you can see what it's all about yourself for just a couple bucks by buying it from Bookwalker with the promo code Mother's Basement. Be sure to act quick if you want to make that March 6th deadline for the poster contest. Or you can buy any number of light novel or manga ebooks instead. There's a ton of great stuff to choose from, with more being added all the time. You know what else has stuff being added all the time? This very YouTube channel. And you can make sure you catch all of it by subscribing to Mother's Basement and turning on notifications. You have my gratitude if you do, and of course, as always, I have to thank my patrons for supporting me in making all of these videos. They wouldn't exist without you guys. Now, if you want to hear me talk about Konosuba some more, you should check out this video where I analyze the first openings for both it and ReZero. Or... Or, if you want to hear me talk about its opposite, here's a playlist of me shitting on Sword Art Online. But if this is the last I see of you today, I'm Jeff Thu, Professional Shitbag, signing out from my apartment that I own. That doesn't work.